All right, apologies for the delay, but the stream has begun. We are live um, and we will start with Senator Peters. Please go ahead and present your bill today. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee. Um, I am not superstitious, but my bill is Senate Bill 666. So I'm a, I'm a little nervous about this bill, but I've never had this before, but I'm hoping that we can get over that. Um, this is a bill you heard last year that you passed last year and that did not get any movement on the other side. Um, this is part of a uh, package that we put together a couple years ago when I met with Judge Barbera. Uh, we have since been able to put uh, money in the capital budget for the new, hopefully, Maryland Supreme Court. Um, we've got the planning money in and we've also got, uh, we're gonna move up the design money this year after a big fight to really give what I consider to be our highest court the honor it's due. Uh, we walked through the building, it was leaky, there were all kinds of problems with it. And so this was a package that we came up with and I thank you guys for putting it through last year. Um, so basically what the bill does, very simply, it changes the name of the Court of Appeals to the Supreme Court of Maryland. It changes the name of the Special Court of Appeals to the Appellate Court of Maryland. It renames Chief Judge, the Chief Judge of Supreme Court. And that's what it does. It has to go on the ballot. And it's a shame it didn't go last year because we could have put it on the ballot and I'm sure it would have passed. But I just thank you again for letting me reintroduce the bill. Thank you, Senator Peters. I feel like we should be so, like those buildings that don't have a 13th floor. We should just skip this bill number and keep moving. Um, Chief Judge, go ahead whenever you're ready. All right. Oh, uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Waldstriker and distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on Senate Bill Triple uh, Six or 666 <laughs> to avoid. Uh, I too watched the movie The Omen many, many years ago. Uh, I am he, uh, Chief Judge of the Court of Appeals, and with me this afternoon is Chief Judge Matthew Fader of the Court of Special Appeals. We are, as uh, Senator Peters uh, mentioned, we're here to testify in support of the name changes proposed by this bill. The history of the appellate courts of Maryland, as you know, uh, members of the committee, goes back to long, long before the Revolutionary War. We, we charted back to the mid-17th century century. It is a history deserving respect, preservation, and celebration. Although one or two other states may dispute the claim, we know we're right, and that our Court of Appeals is the oldest appellate court in the nation. I see Senator Sinmore smiling at all my, we know we're right. <laughs> our name, however, is the source of much confusion, for it is one of only two states plus the District of Columbia that has named its highest court, the Court of Appeals. 48 states call their highest appellate court their Supreme Court, with many referring to their intermediate appellate court as a Court of Appeals. There is confusion from beyond the borders of our state as lawyers, and you can imagine, lawyers, law students, and litigants research, contact, and even file papers with the wrong court when they're coming to Maryland. That same confusion persists among Marylanders. They are most familiar with the nation's Supreme Court and expect that Maryland would have the same name for its highest court. Preventing new confusion is good reason not to rename the Court of Special Appeals as the Court of Appeals if the highest court's name becomes the Supreme Court of Maryland. And I know uh, Chief Judge Fader will speak to that point when he um, makes his remarks to the committee. Imagine though trying to research case law and not knowing whether the opinion of the Court of Appeals is of the intermediate appellate court or the Supreme Court. What would be challenging for a lawyer or a law student would be overwhelming as you can imagine for the self-represented litigant. Changing the names to what Senator Peters proposes 
both cures long-standing confusion and prevents new confusion. Thank you, Senator Peters, for submitting again this year another bill to rename our appellate courts. Our appellate courts do carry a rich history. They will continue to do so even as their names change to meet the need for greater clarity about their roles. The efforts to resolve the confusion caused by the names of Maryland's appellate courts are not new. They're going back to the 1967-68 Constitutional Commission and Convention here in Maryland, and then again throughout the 1990s when uh, on repeated occasions, members of the court and others supported the name change. I urge your support for a long overdue change that will help the people of Maryland and beyond understand Maryland's courts better. I turn now to Chief Judge Fader, who will give you his thoughts regarding changing the name of the Court of Special Appeals. Thank you, Chief Judge Barbera. Good afternoon, Chair Smith, Vice Chair Waldstriker, members of the committee, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here with you virtually. I, I saw, can you hear me? I saw, okay, good. Uh, so thank you uh, very much for the opportunity to be here this afternoon with you virtually. When the Court of Special Appeals first opened its doors in 1967, it was a court of limited and so properly referred to as special jurisdiction. As originally authorized by the General Assembly, my court's jurisdiction was limited only to hearing criminal appeals. At that time, the Court of Appeals was the court of general appellate jurisdiction for all other cases emerging from Maryland's circuit and orphans courts. Relatively quickly, the General Assembly saw fit to expand the jurisdiction of the Court of Special Appeals, first to torts, then to domestic relations, then to workers' compensation, and ultimately, by about 1972, to almost every type of case that first makes its way through Maryland's circuit and orphans' courts. Today, we stand as an inaptly named court. Although we like to consider ourselves a special court, identifying the types of appeals we handle as special is now a misnomer. In truth, we are now a court of general appeals, and I might add, happily and proudly so. Unfortunately, the misnomer does at times sow confusion among members of the public, as Chief Judge Barbera referenced. I would venture to say that the average Marylander, given the names of our two courts and asked which is higher, would be more likely to identify mine. Most lawyers in the state do not suffer from that confusion, of course, but non-lawyers in the state, including self-represented litigants, and lawyers and judges outside of the state do. I know that for a fact. The name change presented by this bill would help to eliminate that confusion. For that reason, I also urge your support for the bill renaming the Court of Special Appeals. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. I uh, enjoy this uh, this hearing not only for the uh, the subject matter but just the history uh, as last year. So I appreciate the history. It's always interesting. Um, all right. Well, thank you, Senator Peters. Well, that concludes the uh, testimony. We'll turn over to the committee for questions. I think the committee is fairly familiar with this bill as we passed it out last year. Questions from the committee? All right. Seeing none, Chief Judge, Judge, thank you. Thank you both very much. And thank you, Senator Peters. Have a good one. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so with that, that will uh, conclude the hearing for Senate Bill 666. Um, we'll now move on to Senate Bill uh, 670 and 669 uh, with Vice Chair Wallstriker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I wanted to kind of just start speaking from the heart and then, then switch over to my written testimony. And, um, and specifically want to reach out to the three newer members of the committee um, including our two members in law enforcement. Because when we think about jury trials, we think about that, that, that being, that is something really desirable, right? It's in our US constitution. In criminal cases, people have a right to a jury trial. And we think that juries are kind of the place where justice is done. And that makes sense. And that's what we see on television. And most people who request a jury trial who are criminal defendants, uh, I mean, most people who are criminal defendants that request um, a trial request a, a jury um, to make that final decision on their fate. 
Um, and that's why this bill is a little counterintuitive because in civil cases, juries are, or the request for a jury is oftentimes an obstacle to justice. And here's why that is. In our lower level trial court, district court, uh, there are no juries. There are juries in our circuit court. And so when someone has a relatively um, low level case without a lot of dollars at stake, they prefer going to the district court where things move more quickly and efficiently because what they wanna do is quickly get in front of a judge and tell their story and receive the compensation that they deserve as victims. If they have to go to the circuit court and have a jury trial, that means hiring experts and bringing in all this stuff. And because the circuit court has to impanel juries, it takes a lot longer. And so I know this sounds counterintuitive, especially to our members who are used to this from a law enforcement point of view, but jury trials don't provide the quick and efficient justice that we want for tort victims in the state. And you know that's the case because, well, insurance companies are the ones requesting a jury trial, which seems weird because um, when you're going in front of the public, a lot of members of the public don't exactly love insurance companies. And so why would the insurance companies be the ones that want the jury trial? when folks generally dislike insurance companies, it's not because they're gonna get a more favorable outcome from a jury. It's because they know that requesting the jury will delay the case, providing them leverage for the plaintiff, the victim to settle earlier and below the compensation that they deserve. And so that's why this feels a little backwards, but I wanted to kind of clarify that up front. Jury trials, for small tort claims are antithetical to the interest of justice. So with that, let me kind of um, put it um, uh, more technically in my formal testimony. So SB 699 and SB 670 are, um, are bills that work together. One's a constitutional amendment and one is the law implementing it that alters the amount in controversy from $15,000 to $30,000. So these two bills are in because like I said, one is a, is a constitutional amendment, one is the statutory change to implement it. They've been brought before the committee in previous years, including last year when the bill had bipartisan co-sponsorship. So as I mentioned, Maryland's district court has exclusive jurisdiction in claims for $5,000 or less and concurrent jurisdiction with the circuit courts in claims for the amount above $5,000, but less than $30,000. District courts do not conduct jury trials. Raising the threshold is a practice that the legislature has undergone every dozen years or so. The Maryland constitution that we work off of drafted in 1850, established an amount in controversy of $5. Beginning in 1970, the amount in controversy requirement has increased to $500 in 1970, $5,000 in 1982, $10,000 in 1998, and $15,000 in 2010. In other words, it's been more than a decade since the legislature last addressed this threshold. Now, even if we set aside the fact that this threshold has not been addressed in quite a long time, there are several other standalone reasons in which passage of this amendment would be good for the state and for victims who are our constituents. This bill would bring about more efficient justice, more equitable recovery for claimants receiving awards and ease the court's return to normalcy following the COVID-19 era. So we'll have some proponents, they'll go into more detail. However, by, by increasing the jury demand to $30,000, all civil cases filed in district court will stay in district court. District court is already equipped to handle civil cases up to $30,000 and has ample methods of retaining expert witness testimony and doesn't require jury selection, as I mentioned. Civil cases filed in district court for amounts between 15,000 and 30,000 currently risk having a defendant, meaning an insurance company in most cases, demand a jury trial, which places the claim within the circuit court's jurisdiction. 
what this does is essentially restart the clock for victims and prolongs the circuit court proceedings, which makes it more expensive, requires jury selection, and means longer wait times for trial and for justice. Civil claims filed in district court for amounts between 15,000 and 30,000 are subject to jury demand and relocation to circuit court. Victims pursuing civil remedies are often faced with an impossible choice, accepting less recovery for fear of having the case relocated to circuit court. So increasing the jury demand threshold will allow claimants to keep their claims in district court and seek recovery for amounts between $15,000 and $30,000. Finally, this bill will go far in alleviating the work of the circuit court and its COVID-19 backlog of jury cases. By keeping cases filed in district court, in district court, the circuit court can better preside over the backlog of cases. This backlog, by the way, is extensive. You'll hear testimony about this, um, and no one knows for sure. But in my mind, there's no question that the backlog created by the closure of the courts will last in the years, oftentimes two, two and a half years into 2023. That's a long way away. Moving these cases to the district court without juries makes these things go much faster so that claimants can get the compensation they deserve. So with that, Mr. Chair, I will finish. Um, mention that um, a lot of the lawyers who practice in this area will be testifying. They can answer more technical questions, and I'll ask for a favorable report. Excellent. Thank you, Vice Chair Walsh. Thank you for bringing us before us again. Um, so we'll start off with the proponents, and your primary witness is Mr. Plaxon. Mr. Plaxon, good to see you. As the primary witness, you'll have uh, five minutes. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. It's good to see you, albeit virtually. Um, I miss coming down to Annapolis this time of year. I've been doing it for a long time. Um, there are some new members of the committee. I am Bruce Plaxen. Uh, I have been um, a legislative chair, past president, and uh, PAC chair for now 20 years of the Maryland Association for Justice. Um, also, I have been practicing tort law for 40 years in Maryland. It's a long time. And I'm going to start by telling you the importance of speedy justice. Uh, speedy justice was so important that it was a major provision of the Magna Carta in 1215, which prohibited anyone from delaying justice. Um, later, uh, a, an axiom spoken often is that justice delayed is justice denied, either attributed to William Penn or William Gladstone. Uh, the reason I tell you that is because that's what this is. This is justice denied. Um, district courts jurisdiction many years ago were increased by this committee, by the legislature from $20,000 to $30,000 with the intent that cases uh, in controversy with uh, amounts in controversy less than $30,000 would stay in the district court and be decided by the judges uh, of the district court. Effectively, that is not what happens in Maryland because our constitution allows uh, insurance companies and other defendants to demand a jury trial for anything above 15,000. So essentially, we are capping jurisdiction in the district court at 15,000. Effectively, the $30,000 uh, jurisdiction just doesn't work because anything above 15,000 ends up in circuit court. For those of you who don't practice a lot of civil law, I'm going to give you a very brief outline of the differences between district court and circuit court. District court is where you go for a traffic ticket or a small claims action. Uh, and many cases are heard in one day. There is a judge familiar with these cases that can adjudicate these very quickly. What happens is it starts off just like a circuit court case in that a uh, lawsuit is filed, a summons is issued. And when service is effectuated, you are generally in court within three to four months, maybe five months at most, um, you answer written interrogatories under oath, telling about your case, your past damages, giving your doctors, you exchange your exhibits, and you go in front of a judge that adjudicates this case, hears from the client, hears from the defendant, hears from any witnesses that he decide wants to bring, and the case is over in about one hour. Typically, these cases are done in one hour in the district court. So within four to five months, start to finish. If you sue for $30,000 or $20,000 or $25,000 now, 
um, the insurance carrier most likely will pray will, will demand a jury trial. Now, at that point, not only do you answer the written questions, but your client is subjected and all witnesses to depositions. Depositions now are about five dollars a page. They run hundreds of pages. So depositions, even in a simple case, will run into the thousands of dollars, thousands of dollars. Um, Unlike a district court judge, juries are not familiar with medical records, so it becomes necessary to bring an expert into court, the treating doctor usually. Treating doctor like an orthopedist or a chiropractor will charge several thousand dollars to come to court or, or go on videotape deposition. There are more court fees for more depositions to put your experts on tape. Your client will miss uh, work and, uh, during the, the uh, pendency of the litigation because he or she will have to attend a mediation, which has costs, uh, several hundred dollars per side. They will go to a settlement conference. And typically pre-COVID in Howard County, uh, cases took 13 months, according to the court data I've been provided. And in Baltimore County, 16 to 18 months. Now that was pre-COVID. Very, very few cases could be heard within a year. So instead of getting to court in four or five months, there is a year and there's thousands of dollars in expenses. Um, that is just not feasible. Now I want you to picture a typical auto accident case. There's maybe $5,000 in damage to the automobile, $5,000 in medical bills. You're, you're in the simplest case, someone goes to, to an emergency room, they have maybe a, a CT scan, a few x-rays, they get a few weeks of treatment with a physical therapist, chiropractor, orthopedist, and their bills are several thousand dollars. And then they miss a few weeks of work and they could be out another $5,000. It quickly adds up to $15,000. And that does not include any money for pain, aggravation, suffering, inconvenience. Now that case cannot be brought in today's environment in the district court. So that client has to, uh, you, can, you can file for $30,000, but almost 100% of the time, State Farm or the other auto carriers will take that case, demand a jury trial, and delay you for about a year. Um, during that year, your client's car or your, your constituent's car remains unfixed uh, or undrivable. During that time, their medical bills are unpaid. The doctor's uh, cash flow is affected. Your client is done. Their credit rating is affected. And during that time, they can't pay certain bills because the three or four weeks of wages that they didn't get paid for while they were out of work never gets paid because the uh, insurance carrier is waiting to get to court. My clients, your constituents cannot afford to wait two or three years to get to court to get justice when we can do this in four or five um, months. Now, it's not just car accidents. Yeah. Sorry, did, did the time go? Did you, I'm sorry, did the time go? I thought I it was. I don't know, yes. I don't see a timer. Has it been five minutes? Yes. Yes, it's time. Okay, I'm, great. Sorry, I wouldn't respect to keeping work. you on schedule. I will <laughs> let everyone else fill in the gaps. No, 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 I wasn't quite sure I heard it as well. So th I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, okay, great. So with that, thank you, Mr. Plaxon. Uh, next, we'll have uh, Ms. Orsi, you are up. All right, thank you, Chairman Smith. Um, thank you, Vice Chair Waltzreicher for sponsoring this bill. Uh, thank you, committee members, for giving me the opportunity to testify before you this afternoon. My name is Amy Worsey. I am the current president of the Maryland Association for Justice. I also have been representing victims in personal injury cases, auto crashes, slip and falls for almost 20 years. My office is in Towson, but I do practice all over the state. Um, testifying in support of this bill uh, by allowing an amendment to increase the jury demand to $30,000, a large number of our cases um, could be resolved more quickly and more efficiently. Um, I did testify um, last year um, in support of this bill and based on some of the opponent's testimony, I did um, pull uh, cases that had been filed pre-COVID um, to more accurately be able to testify as to the amount of time it takes for our clients to get a jury trial scheduled when filing in the circuit court. On average, um, cases throughout the state take approximately 13 to 15 months for a trial date to be issued after the filing of the complaint. 
Uh, with the courts being closed and jury trials being suspended for over a year, it's taking even longer for our clients to get trial dates. Two to three day jury trials are already being scheduled well into 2022 and even into 2023. Uh, the backlog of trial dates created by this pandemic is tremendous, and it's going to take years for the courts to get out of this backlog. And even when the jury trials resume, it will be far from business as usual. With this amendment, cases that are filed in the district court can stay in the district court. As Mr. Plaxon had said, the typical district court case can be tried within six months and generally resolved within an hour before a judge. Um, even in light of COVID, the district courts are being able to try these cases in some form, whether it be live or remotely. Uh, because of the type of damages these cases have, it is not economically feasible to try them in the circuit courts because of the increased costs in discovery and litigation and the need for expert witnesses, discovery, as you heard, is limited in the district court. There are no depositions. Uh, interrogatories are limited, and the medical records and bills can be introduced into evidence for the judge to review without needing to call for witnesses. In closing, this amendment would keep cases that belong in district court in the district court. The district courts do not have the level of backlog as the circuit courts, and it will greatly assist our clients and your constituents in getting their day in court. Our clients have already been significantly hampered in getting their access to justice because of COVID and this amendment would allow them to get the access that has been denied for the past year. So I urge a favorable report and thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Orsi. And again, Mr. Flaxen, our apologies. We don't have a timer displayed. Uh, so we, we rely on kind of the voice of God to tell us. Uh, so I appreciate that. And uh, Mr. Flaxen, I always appreciate the Magna Carta going back all the way to 1225 and King John. So it's, it's solid, that's solid work. All right. Um, so we'll now move on to uh, Mr. Muncie. You are up next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the committee for having us today. Uh, I want to focus on some of the comments that were made at the hearing last year when it was said that trials usually happen within nine months and that a lot of the carriers often do not demand a jury trial in these cases. And I want to rebut those you know, preemptively because in our experience with our members, my own practice, I've been doing this for eight years. I'm partners with Bruce. Uh, we exclusively handle personal injury cases. You can pretty much count on the majority of the insurance carriers demanding a jury trial if you file for more than 15,000 in the district court. Uh, Mr. Peterson is on the call today. He is the house counsel head for State Farm. State Farm universally uh, demands jury trials if you file for more than 15,000 in, in the district court. When we talk to our clients about their choices, we really tell them, you know, this case may be worth 20, 25, but that's the value that we think it's worth. But there's a good chance if we file for more than 15,000 in the district court, they'll demand a jury trial and they'll be waiting a year, a year and a half, and the expenses will run several thousand dollars. So that the money that you can get in the, in the circuit court is actually going to um, be less than what you would get filing for 15 in the district court. And that's denying our clients the justice they deserve in these cases. Um, it's denying them the, the speedy access. It's denying them the value that their case is entitled to. And we have a system set up in the district court to expediently uh, resolve these cases without the need for experts, without the need for people to miss work to come and serve on a jury. And this was an important issue pre-COVID, but after COVID, after jury trials have been shut down for the better part of a year and ongoing, it's extremely important that the smaller cases do not take up the valuable time of the circuit courts, do not take up the valuable time of our jurors and let the cases that have more serious issues, including criminal cases, more um, significant civil cases, those are the cases that need the resources of our jury system, not the smaller cases that can be resolved in the district court in four, four to six months with minimal costs and get people the justice they deserve. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, Mr. Muncie. And next we'll hear from Ms. Burnett, there you are, you're up. Hi, thank you. My name is Suzanne Burnett. I am here with the Maryland Association for Justice today, and I'm a partner and trial lawyer with Potter Burnett Law in Bowie, Maryland. I've been doing exclusively personal injury work representing victims of negligence for about 10 years, and I have seen this negatively impact my clients and many other uh, colleagues' clients. And so I don't want to reiterate what others have already said, but I do want to just highlight a real-life case example that's happening right now with one of my clients. 
we filed uh, a lawsuit because he was rear-ended. He had about $15,000 in medical bills, but the case was pretty basic. And in speaking with him, the value of the case was somewhere between 25 and 30. Filed in the district court, defense, which is the insurance company, prayed a jury trial, and the jury trial was set for 18 months later. 18 months later was June of 2020, which is in the middle of the pandemic. The court reset it to November 2020. We're still in a pandemic. It's now been reset to the end of August of 2021, and we've been told that that's just a wish and a prayer and a hope because there's a huge backlog and the criminal cases are going to get priority, as they should. But it's a perfect example of a case that was filed in January of 2019 that if it remained in the district court where its value was, where it belonged, it would have been well done and over with before the pandemic and in the first half of 2019. So I just bring this up to say these are real people. These are real cases. They're victims who were involved in an unplanned event. They end up with unplanned medical expenses, and sometimes those bills are lingering over their heads for years and years to come. In this particular case, we hope that we'll have a jury trial within a thousand days of filing. And that is just not efficient. It is a delay, <clears throat> excuse me, to justice as Bruce has brought up. And so we are asking that you uh, act now. The time is now because of the COVID backlog. And so we're asking for a favorable uh, review on this amendment. Thank you. So thank you very much, Ms. Burnett. Um, so with that, that'll conclude the testimony for the proponents of the bill. We'll now switch over to the opposition panel and we'll start off with uh, Ms. Egan. You are up next. Um, good afternoon. My name is Nancy Egan from the American Property Casualty Insurance Association. Um, we are a large property and casualty trade association writing about 60% of the property and casualty insurance marketplace. So I don't usually testify in front of your committee. So um, hello, and I'm glad to see everyone on screen. I, I just like to make a few points. Um, number one, um, this is a bill that would not go into effect until 1-1-2023 because it would have to go on the jury ballot. So I'm not too sure why it's necessary to pass this legislation this year. Perhaps it would be better to delay this and, and wait until next year to ask this to go onto the ballot because there's some other issues to address. In addition, um, while I appreciate some of the comments, um, I do hope that uh, people do not look as insurance companies as obstacles to justice. I think that our policyholders expect us to defend their interests to the best of our ability. So I don't think we're obstacles to justice. So I understand when we're plaintiffs and defense counsel going against each other, we may use loose terms, but I, I think we're trying to represent our insurers as best to our ability. In addition, by raising this limits up to 30,000, we're already the highest in the country for jury trial uh, thresholds. This would make us even more higher, um, I guess higher, excuse me. Um, just recently, uh, uh, if you'll look at Louisiana and my testimony, they were at 50,000 and had the highest insurance rates in the country for auto. And a part of their tort reform to bring down those costs, they decided and passed law and that went into effect in July of 2020 to lower their jury threshold limits down to 10,000 to provide a better forum for people with auto claims to defend their cases. So with that, um, thank you very much for permitting me to testify. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Egan. Uh, we'll now move on to Mr. Kirkner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee, Andrew Kirkner on behalf of the National Association of Mutual Insurance Companies. Uh, NAMIC is comprised of more than 1,400 member companies across the country. Uh, we are very proud uh, to have 11 of those member companies domiciled in the state of Maryland. Um, I think oftentimes folks look at insurance companies as these huge uh, behemoth companies that they may see on the Super Bowl. But what I'd like to keep, uh, like for the committee to keep in mind uh, as we discuss this important bill is that uh, they do range from the large insurers all the way down uh, to those Maryland domestic companies, the smaller companies. Uh, and so this, this bill would, would unfavorably impact uh, the entire gamut, and we would ask for an unfavorable report. I just want to briefly, uh, Mr. Chairman, touch on comments that were made uh, sort of in the opening of this bill, uh, that the only purpose for demanding a jury trial is, a, is to delay as a delay tactic. 
Uh, Mr. Peterson, I think, is going to go into some additional detail as to why that's, in fact, not the case. But I would just tell you from, from our perspective, representing the mutual insurance industry, uh, uh, the, these companies, their owners are the policyholders themselves. You know, there's not some stock owner uh, in the back room getting rich uh, as justice is delayed, as, as the, the, uh, some of the earlier testimony would have the committee believe. Uh, instead, all policyholders have an interest in accurate results. Uh, in, in the accurate determination of justice. And so certainly a deposition versus a written interrogatory provides a, a forum in which uh, that, that uh, accurate look at justice can, can occur. Uh, the second thing I would just reiterate Ms. Egan's point that Maryland is already one of the highest in, uh, jury threshold states in the country. Most states do not have a jury threshold uh, for an insurer to demand a jury trial. Then finally, in closing, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would just point the committee's attention uh, to a study uh, commissioned by the General Assembly last year uh, by MAFE on auto ins uh, insurance affordability and the under and the uninsured motorist population. Um, if anything, one of the recommendations uh, provided by the industry in that study, uh, if, if Maryland is looking to make insurance more affordable, if it is looking to lower uh, its uninsured motorist population, it should be looking to lower the jury threshold, not increase it as this bill would do. Uh, so uh, for the reasons stated, we, uh, we request an unfavorable report. Thank you very much, Mr. Kirkner. We'll now have um, Mr. Peterson, you're up. Thank you, Chairman Smith, uh, Vice Chair Wallstrike, members of the committee. Um, I'm Barrett Peterson. I've managed State Farm Staff Council Office since 1991 and been in practice longer than that. Uh, there are two reasons that uh, the, the, uh, the Maryland Association of Justice like this bill. They told you about one, and I'll address that one second. But the real reason is this. They get more money in low-value cases from district court judges than they'll ever get from a jury. Let me give you an example. An accident, very little damage to either car. The plaintiff calls their lawyer before they go see a doctor. The lawyer sends them to a doctor that gets 100% of their practice from plaintiff lawyer referrals, and they run up a bunch of bills. And district court judges have, many of them have no trouble with that and award hefty awards where our client may look to us afterwards and say, can I appeal this? And the answer is no. If the judge found as a fact this person was injured, then you can't appeal it and the verdict stands. Whereas if a jury were to hear the same case, most of the time they would say, this person wasn't hurt, we're not awarding them anything. And while I can't tell you how much the overall effect of higher verdicts will have on insurance rates, common sense and Louisiana's experience tells us that higher verdicts do have an impact on your constituents' insurance rates. And we are, as has been said, the highest jury trial threshold in the country already. Louisiana's experience and, uh, had them roll theirs back. This would make us an even further outlier. The, the expense part, the, the bringing in experts part is a fallacy. If they leave that complaint in circuit court for $30,000, they do not have to bring in an expert to, uh, to prove their medical bills. And every one of the practitioners before you knows that. Um, I, there has been a significant delay with the pandemic. No one would deny that. Um, and that was true last year and this year and probably into next year. But this bill won't take effect at the earliest until January of 23. And we don't know what that will do. So they're, they're asking for this to remedy a temporary problem and it won't even remedy that. Uh, the uh, cases that are originally filed in circuit court do take 12 to 13 months. But I looked at many cases last year that were filed in district court removed a circuit court and then fast tracked in Baltimore City, Baltimore County, Prince George's, Montgomery County, they're fast tracked so that a trial date within eight months of the original filing date in district court is not unheard of. So there's not significant expense. There's not significant delay in ordinary circumstances. Uh, it, there are higher awards that uh, the cost of which are passed on to all of your constituents. So uh, I would recommend uh, an unfavorable uh, ruling on this. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Peterson. And rounding out the opposition panel, we'll have uh, Mr. Enton. You are uh, up next. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, good afternoon. Uh, yeah. Robert Enton on behalf of the American Property Casualty Insurers Association. I won't belabor the point. I certainly agree with everything that the other opponents to this bill said. Um, let me just point out, make a couple uh, points. Um, the, I think one of the most dramatic 
uh, things that occurs uh, from in the difference between district court and circuit court is pretty much the complete and total lack of discovery. You get to ask 15 interrogatory questions, written questions, and that's it. So um, if you are the defendant and you're the one who is um, uh, uh, at risk, in this case, the insurance company is not the defendant. The defendant is whoever is getting sued. And the district court process is extremely limited. You can't file a motion for summary judgment in the district court and get out early. You can only do that in the circuit court. And why is it that the plaintiff, the plaintiff uh, can have the right to play, to play a jury trial, but not the defendant? I frankly don't understand that. I mean, it's just a matter of I'm the defendant. You're the plaintiff. We have the same rights. We should have the same rights. Now we're just going to increase the disparity. My final point, Mr. Chairman, would be I agree with the comment that there's absolutely no reason to pass this bill now. If this has anything to do with COVID, let's pass this bill. If you want to pass it next year and bring it up, and then we'll know where we stand with COVID when it goes on the ballot. So for those reasons, I join the other opponents in saying you should give this bill an unfavorable report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Renton. And with that, that'll conclude the testimony for Senate Bills 670 and 669. And I'll turn it over to the committee for questions. We have two new members of the committee maybe haven't seen this issue before. All right, seeing none. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Vice Chair. And that'll conclude the hearing for Senate Bill 670 and 669. I see that Senator Eckert is here. And so she is up next. We'll have Senator Eckert with Senate Bill 698. Senator Eckert, you're up. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, Mr. Vice Chair and members of JPR Committee. I'm Senator Addy Eckert for the record here today on Senate Bill 698, which is Real Property Transfer on Death Deed Task Force. Sounds ominous, doesn't it? Um, this bill is brought to me uh, by our Mitchell pro bono, pro bono group. As you know, COVID has exacerbated a multitude of dilemmas that we have in our communities and really, uh, really highlighted many of our low-income Marylanders in particular. Those families face a lot of barriers when they're trying to transfer property to the next generation, uh, including the liens. These challenges create unreasonable economic burdens for families and can many times displace families and ultimately leading to homelessness. Senate Bill 698 was worked on um, by a number of groups to establish a task force that would study the use of what's called a transfer on deed in the state, which would allow real property to transfer to a beneficiary automatically upon death. Um, in consultation with relevant experts, this task force would study other jurisdictions that have implemented the use of such a transfer on death deed and report its findings by December 1st of 2022. Um, thank you for your consideration. I know uh, study groups and task forces aren't always popular, but I really think that this one um, has the impetus to be a, a pretty focused group and could a, establish a number of recommendations that we could move forward in the future. So I respectfully ask for a favorable report on Senate Bill 698. And I believe Meredith Lathbury Gerard is going to present even more specifics about why this is initiative is needed at this point in time. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Senator Eckert. And yes, I have uh, her, Ms. Gerard, as the primary witness. She'll have five minutes although I don't see her in the room. Sandy, do you see her here? I don't see her in the waiting room or in the room. Okay, then we have, next we have um, Mr. Chance. Uh, is he here? He is here. Yes. here. Thank, okay. you. thank you, Mr. Chance. Okay, excellent, there you are. All right, great. All right, so thank you, Mr. Chair, distinguished members of the committee for the opportunity to testify today. So my name is Timothy Chance. I am the Tangled Title Attorney at Maryland Volunteer Lawyer Service. And I assist without my home, my deed, my legacy project. As part of this project, I encounter many clients who, due to the expensive and time-consuming nature of probate, are unable to pass their property onto the heirs. 
I'm here today to respectfully give you my reasons to support Senate Bill 698. So in the My Home, My Deed, My Legacy project, MVLS provides homeowner clinics to Marylanders to help stabilize their homes and secure critically important resources for the long-term ability to remain in those homes. Additionally, we provide direct representation, both by volunteer attorneys and myself, to clients navigating the probate process. So in both the clinics and in direct representation, one of the, most, one of the main focuses that we look at is advising on clients on how to avoid probate where possible. Probate can cost several hundred dollars, take a minimum of nine months to open and administer and close the estate. Now clients are homeowners who are facing financial hardship. They often don't have the resources to cover these expenses. So for this reason, it's imperative that they pass as many assets outside of probate as possible. So MVLS provides a comprehensive estate planning approach that includes life estate deeds to protect the home for the client. So the life estate deeds are an alternative to the client adding their children to the deed, which would open the client up to exploitation. Life estate deeds are a great tool to address the barrier that probate raises, but they have their own challenges, including deed recording requirements and cost. So transfer on death deeds, sorry, transfer on death deeds would provide another alternative uh, to the probate barrier for many of Maryland's most vulnerable residents. Transfer on death deeds provide a statutory form that would allow Maryland homeowners a more accessible vehicle to keep their homes and their families. And I believe transfer on death deeds are worth exploring as an additional option because of the challenges mentioned. So MVLS supports Senate Bill 698 because we're committed to removing all barriers so that all Marylanders can participate in the judicial system and the creation of a task force would provide the opportunity to explore a tool to make the system more equitable. So Mr. Chair, and members of the committee, thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Excellent, thank you, Mr. Chance. And seeing if Ms. Gerard is here, um, I don't think she is. Um, with that, that'll conclude the testimony for Senate Bill 698. I'll turn back to the committee for questions. Seeing none, thank you very much, Senator Eckert, and thank you, Mr. Chance. With that, that'll conclude the hearing for Senate Bill 698. We'll now move on to Senator Hedelman, uh, Senate Bill 691. Senator Hedelman, you're up. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members of the committee, I am here happily presenting Senate Bill 691 which is actually an innovative idea. And I can't say that I claim it for myself, but I did read about it. And um, turns out a colleague uh, across the way on the House side had also been looking into this issue. And so we're really happy today to present to you the idea of a reusable tenant screening report. So this bill would allow prospective tenants to provide a reusable tenant screening report to a landlord for the purpose of vetting their housing application. The goal of the legislation is to increase the accuracy of tenant screening reports and to save tenants money. And I would draw a comparison to the Common App that many of us and many, many of our kids perhaps used when applying for college. It's using a document that gathers the same data and information but doesn't burden the applicant with redundant filings and fees. So under this bill, landlords would have the option, they would not be mandated at all, but they would have the option to accept a tenant screening report. They would, also, they would have to publicly state on their website if they accept a reusable tenant screening report. This bill is modeled after a law in Washington state and that's been in effect since 2016. And there are hundreds of landlords and apartment complexes in Washington that have opted to use reusable tenant screening reports, including several companies that also operate in Maryland. Nine out of 10 landlords rely on tenant screening reports to make decisions about who to rent to. And these reports typically contain information about an applicant's personal and financial characteristics, including their credit history, arrests, and criminal convictions, evictions, and employment. And many of these reports are generated automatically within seconds by computer algorithms and are never viewed by a real human being before they're provided to the landlord. And that removes the opportunity to ensure that the information that they're receiving is correct. And at the bottom of my testimony, there's an article, and we're going to send out the live link, um, where the New York Times just a few months ago detailed what can happen, the really pretty dramatic effects of what can happen when incorrect information gets into these reports. Many of the reports don't include the applicant's detailed housing and criminal records and instead only provide either a thumbs up or a thumbs down risk assessment. And this means, like I said, that sometimes inaccurate or mismatched information isn't caught on the screening report prior to the rejection of the applicant. The applicant does have 30 days under federal and state law to correct it, but oftentimes that 
the apartment might be gone by that time. Um, they are those kinds of uh, errors in consumer reports are common. And the FTC found that one in four consumers have a potentially material error in their consumer report that actually makes them look riskier than they are. Given the current eviction crisis, many Marylanders will be seeking to rent new housing and may face an even harder time securing housing because of inaccuracies on their reports. A reusable tenant screening report is prepared by a consumer reporting agency that has to adhere to those federal and state laws and contains the same information as a consumer report directly procured by the landlord. The report contains information verification, eviction and housing history and a comprehensive search of the applicant's criminal history. But unlike a traditional consumer report, a reusable tenant screening report is paid for directly by the prospective tenant and is offered free of charge to prospective landlords. And a tenant can reuse the screening report an unlimited number of times within a 30 day period. An example of a company that provides reusable screening reports is called MoCo and their, their, um, their link is myscreeningreport.com. You can actually go there and see what they're talking about. Um, in Maryland, landlords are currently able to charge a prospective tenant up to $25 as an application fee to cover the cost of obtaining a consumer report to screen the applicant. And in many competitive housing markets, prospective tenants need to apply for multiple apartments before finding housing. It can be an expensive process for the applicant as they must pay the cost of the tenant screening fee for each application. With a reusable tenant screening report, the tenant only needs to pay the fee once thereby saving them money. Reusable tenant screening reports also have the potential to be more accurate. The screening reports, as I said before, often contain in inaccurate information about the applicant, leading to some applicants being unjustly rejected for housing. And such inaccuracies can arise when information is included about other people who have a similar name as the applicant. These reusable tenant screenings are thorough, secure, because you're going to an online portal. You're not showing up with a paper document. You'll hear about some concerns about fraud, which I don't totally buy. We can have that discussion later, but because all of the companies that are doing these screening are um, have to adhere to um, federal and state laws, as I said, and there is a portal through which the landlord will be accessing it independent from the tenant. Um, I urge a favorable report for Senate Bill 691. I think it is a really um, creative and innovative approach um, that doesn't unduly burden um, landlords. And you'll see MMHA and AOBA, the big um, trade associations, are not um, opposed to this bill. So um, there may be some amendments that I'd be happy to discuss and look at with um, some of the folks who you will hear from shortly. But without further ado, I'd like to turn to my panel um, and, and start with Eric Dunn, who's the National House from the National Housing Law Project. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Excellent. Thank you very much, Senator Hedelman, and thank you for bringing this to us. Uh, so as you mentioned, uh, Mr. Dunn is your primary witness, and as such, you'll have five minutes. Mr. Dunn, over to you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for having me. Um, I'm with the National Housing Law Project, and I've been really focusing on rental admission screening for about the last 10 to 12 years of my career. Um, and as the Senator mentioned, uh, accuracy is a um, can be a serious problem with tenant screening reports. Um, the statistic that she mentioned, uh, the one in four um, consumer reports having significant errors, um, that statistic actually comes from studies conducted on financial credit reports, such as an Experian or Equifax TransUnion type consumer report. Um, those, there actually have not been any, uh, any studies. Nobody's been able, to, been able to conduct one into the accuracy of what are called boutique screening reports, which are used for things like employment or uh, rental ad admissions. In my experience, um, those reports, um, the error rate is significantly higher uh, than what you would see in a, a more of a financial type consumer report because nobody's actually been able to conduct a study into those. Um, typically, the industry will cite their dispute statistics, which make the error rate appear vanishingly small just because of how difficult it can be uh, for a consumer to obtain a copy of their report and then lodge a dispute and, and have that corrected as well as the incentives that weigh against that. Um, but beyond the problem of accuracy, um, a lot of people actually do have eviction records, criminal history, they may owe um, claims to former landlords. 
And these are very serious barriers to qualifying for rental housing. Um, if someone owes money to a past landlord, or even if a past landlord claims they owe money, whether they owe it or not, or if they've even been sued for eviction, even if the case was dismissed, but resolved in their favor, um, those, those can often be fatal to a rental application, even if there's nothing else on the application negative about the applicant whatsoever. So even if the information is accurate and correct, um, for a lot of tenants, um, those types of reports still stand as a, as a huge barrier to obtaining housing. Um, and then because most landlords will charge a non-refundable fee um, just to apply for the housing, it creates a dynamic where people that have any of these barriers wind up having to steer themselves toward, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Uh, steer themselves toward rental housing um, that may not be uh, housing of their choice. That may not be functional housing for them. It may be sometimes substandard housing, um, housing that's that's um, not in, in good areas for, uh, for their family to live. Um, and when you're talking about that sort of dynamic playing out with one renter or one household, that's one thing. But um, when this happens on a collective level, um, when thousands and thousands of, of renters that have eviction records, that have other types of negative um, information on their reports um, are, are in this process where either they can, they can continue paying these $25 fees, have forfeited the money, um, having to pay again to apply somewhere else, or else they can um, settle for you know, lower quality housing um, where they think the landlord can't be as selective. Um, it, it, really, it can really sort of drive patterns of cyclical concentration of poverty and really um, residential segregation. Because when you look at who has eviction records, who has criminal records, consistently the studies will show that black women, especially mothers, face eviction at substantially higher rates than any other demographic. Similarly, that people of color face um, involvement in the criminal history, excuse me, involvement in the criminal justice system at substantially higher rates, e even though they don't commit crimes at higher rates, but they face arrest, conviction, uh, and other um, involvement in criminal justice um, programs um, at higher rates. And so they're more likely to have criminal records. They're more likely to have eviction records. They're more likely to be steered by application fees into areas of concentrated poverty. And so rental application fees, even apart from accuracy, is enough of a reason to take on um, that problem. And portable screening reports is a, is a good solution to this um, because it, it enables somebody to pay one fee to get a report that they can use over and over again to apply at housing until they qualify, rather than having to pay a new fee each, each place they apply. Um, and what should really be done would be to prohibit landlords altogether from charging fees for people that have portable screening reports available. This bill doesn't go that far, uh, but what, what it does do is it at least requires landlords to say whether they take portable screening reports. And so that way, if somebody buys one of these, they, they know that there are places where they can take it and, and use it. Um, so it's a good step in the right direction. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mr. Dunn. And next, we'll move on. Just go in order. I'll sign up. So Mr. Losak, you're next. Mr. Losak, my apologies for last night. I'm sorry I got tied up. Uh, we've got a deadline here and we must meet it. So I had to grind it out last night. So my no apologies. apologies necessary, Mr. Chair, and good to see you. Uh, Senator Hellman represented you very well, as did Senator Lee. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Matt Losak. I am co-founder and executive director of the Montgomery County Renters Alliance, an alliance of more than 30 labor, community, religious, political, civic action organizations and thousands of renters. We are Maryland's first and only regional nonprofit dedicated exclusively to renter outreach, education, organizing, and advocacy. And we are a proud co-founder of Renters United Maryland. I want to thank Senator Hedelman for your leadership on this issue and Delegate Polakovich Carr uh, on the other side. Uh, for many years, for, for many renters, especially low-income renters, especially renters of color, it can be especially difficult to find an apartment in Maryland. For many renters, it may be necessary to apply for multiple for homes uh, in multiple apartment communities in order to find an available home. But this means having to pay multiple background fees that may make the process too, too expensive for many and potentially adding to racial segregation in housing. Creating a system where landlords can simply access a credit report from a reputable credit screening company using the landlord's own password or code would ensure one-stop shopping accuracy of tenant screening reports and eliminate multiple tenant fees. 
Further, it would allow for all renters to review their own report information to ensure accuracy while not being able to change that information that will be secure within the uh, agency that holds that report. The bill provides a simple, modern improvement to the rental application process, uh, and we strongly urge a favorable report to Senate Bill 691. Thank you. Excellent, thank you very much, Mr. Losak. All right, next we'll move on to Ms. White. Marceline, good to see you. Good to see you. Um, Senator, Chair, uh, members of the committee. My name is Marceline White, Executive Director of the Maryland Consumer Rights Coalition. And I appreciate the opportunity to come here and speak on behalf of Senate Bill 691. I will not repeat what my colleagues have said, but I do wanna focus on why I think this is an important bill to meet this moment. Um, and I think it's a creative bill. As has been noted, there are issues with adverse credit reports. Um, this is particularly true for Latinx um, communities who have had a number of issues when you look at adverse credit um, because of similar names. Um, but also this is an important issue right now in terms of the pandemic, both the health and the wealth crisis that we're facing. A United Way report found that 39% of Marylanders are struggling economically right now. And as this committee is well aware with all the good work you've done, we certainly have a crisis um, for tenants. Um, my own organization, which um, runs the Fair Housing Action Center and a tenant rights program now has 250 clients, which is the amount we served in 2019. And that's since January, 2021. So there is a huge crisis. There are gonna be people looking for affordable housing. Um, as we're continuing to grapple with solutions to the tenant crisis and the eviction crisis. And there's an affordability issue. Um, I think Senator Heldeman's uh, analogy of the college application process and the Common App is, is good. And as someone who's got a teenager going through that right now, this is a portal and um, it provides a, one, you know, a system that they can review the accuracy, but also the information is safe. Um, but again, if you think about mounting fees, we recently did a survey and found that 45% of African-American households that we polled could not afford an unexpected $500 bill. So if you think about somebody paying $25 fees 10 times, that's $250. We simply have families that cannot afford that kind of cost right now, particularly with COVID-19 and unexpected medical expenses. So we feel like this is the right idea we feel like it provides greater security and an important economic savings for tenants at this time. And I have talked to colleagues in Washington state who have used this, who work on fair housing issues and tenant rights issues, and they found it to be very effective there. So I think there's also a proof of concept that's already um, been proven. So for those reasons, we really support Senate Bill 691 and urge a favorable report, and I'm happy to answer questions. Excellent. Thank you, Ms. White. And now we'll go over to Ms. Hatfield. You're up. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Good afternoon. My name is Carissa Hatfield. I am a staff attorney with the Homeless Persons Representation Project, speaking on behalf of Renters United Maryland today and honored to do so, um, which is a statewide coalition of organizations that support renters' rights. Um, we are strongly in support of Senate Bill 691. Uh, a lot of the information and reasons why Runners United Maryland supports 691 have been covered by my colleagues, and I don't want to spend a lot of time belaboring those points. Um, I do want to say, as part of my experience as an attorney representing tenants in Baltimore City, um, particularly tenants who are subsidized, um, application fees can be an insurmountable obstacle to obtaining safe and sustainable housing. Um, I have a client right now that I'm working with, for example, who has simply um, given up on finding a new apartment um, because she can no longer afford to continue to pay application fees. Um, having the opportunity to use a reusable tenant screening report where a one-time fee would be paid would be an option that's much more feasible for tenants like mine um, who want to move from substandard unsafe housing um, and find new opportunities in safer and more sustainable neighborhoods um, versus paying $25 multiple times um, and facing potential rejection at those sites. It's much safer for them now to stay where they are rather than to try to continue to risk you know, financial ruin in the attempts to find something safer. Um, for the reasons I reiterated by my colleagues and for the reasons stated by myself, um, we strongly support SB 691 and urge a favorable report. Thank you. 
Excellent. Thank you, Ms. Hadfield. And uh, next we'll have Mr. Elman. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Thank you for having me. I'm Eric Elman with the Consumer Data Industry Association, CDIA. Uh, I'm, we are a trade association based in Washington, D.C. We are a trade association of consumer reporting agencies, including the tenant screening companies that we've been talking about uh, here today. We testified last week, uh, uh, obviously, on the House bill. On the House side, we are here today. Uh, and we are not here in opposition. We are uh, in a posture of favorable with amendments. We believe that there are that there is a way that we can get to agreement with the sponsor on the House side, the senator on the senator on this side, who's uh, obviously with us here today. And I feel like there is a path forward that will serve the interests of tenants, the interests of uh, landlords, and the interests of consumer reporting associations, tenant screening companies across the state. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. So I assume the um, I haven't seen this your testimony, but your uh, your amendments are in our file. Uh, I believe that they are. I've been working with Chris DiPietro, who is probably coming up next to make sure that uh, that they've been received by uh, Senator Hedelman and uh, Delegate Polakovich Carr as well. Got it. I'll look. I'll pull it up. Thank you very much. And, and this was this was supposed to come up today, I think, in House Subcommittee, and and uh, at the request of the sponsor on the House side, we moved that till next week to have a continuing conversation about those amendments. Excellent. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, Mr. Petro, you're up. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Chris DiPietro on behalf of the Consumer Data Industry Association. Um, I'm just, just following what Eric says. We think, we think this is a good idea. We understand the goals of the reusable tenant screening report. It makes sense. It will help. I think it will help a lot of individuals, but I think uh, we want to make sure it works properly. Um, so we do have a couple of concerns with the bill as drafted. We have had a conversation uh, with Delegate Polakovich Carr last week. We submitted some amendments uh, to both the delegate and the senator, um, and we, we're having another meeting this afternoon. And we hope to get to a point of agreement. And um, it's not our intent to get in the way of this bill. We 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 just want to make sure it is one that works and works properly uh, from a, a, a logistical perspective because we're the ones that. Actually actually have to uh, administer these and we wanna make sure that they're, uh, they're uh, uh, free of fraud and, 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 um, and open to use by, by the perspective, perspective landlords. So with that, we say favorable with amendment. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. DiPietro. And yeah, I didn't, once you guys get that sorted out over in the house, right. or, we so will. we'll work with Absolutely. So we, can, uh, we can take action on thank it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and with that, I think that concludes the testimony uh, for Senate Bill 691, alternative to committee for questions. Quiet day on the bench. Um, all right, great. Uh, with that, that'll uh, end the hearing for Senate Bill 691. Thank you very much, Senator Hedelman. Thank you all very much. Have a good afternoon. We'll now move over to Senator Lee with Senate Bill 675. Senator Lee, you're up. Good to see you back in the saddle here. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I'm glad I'm I'm glad I'm here too. <laughs> Close call today. Um, okay, I'm glad I'm here for voting too, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Um, okay, this I have my witnesses here today, and they can probably explain even better than I can because they are the witnesses, and they are the uh, they are the experts in this area. And um, this was um, based on the product of a work group that we had uh, child custody involving uh, domestic violence and uh, child abuse. Um, this bill, um, as you know, 675, family law practitioners will be the first to concede that judges presiding over normal contested child custody proceedings may not be always adequately familiar with family law, especially new judges because they may come from backgrounds as uh, prosecutors and few may be able to the table with sufficient family law familiarity. Of course, there's always a learning curve and uh, e as even the judiciary's uh, stauncher supporters would concede, uh, the legislation asks a fundamental question, how do we as policymakers allow judges learning curves bent away from justice and break the backs of vulnerable and voiceless children who through no fault of their own are before the court and are not a party to the proceedings. Even experienced judges 
who get trainings in uh, other areas of family law are encouraged to push for familial contact, yet not always adequately trained to be competent to directly examine the allegations of abuse as required in family law, uh, section 9-101 uh, slash 9-101.1. Training is um, required. The legislation also requires training of court appointed um, lawyers for children at issue in cases of custody and visitation. Uh, the term best interest attorney seems or Orwellian when um, one thinks the preference or interest of a child can be subverted by a lawyer with six hours or perhaps the wrong type of training to handle very complex cases where there are allegations or disclosures of abuse. Too often these uh, ill-trained conduits between warring parents serve as a wall between the facts derived from the children and insulate judges from criticism. At the very least, uh, the court should provide uh, surveys to children once they become adults to understand how the process treated them. Uh, perhaps this report cord uh, would require summer school. Maryland has no continuing education, legal education requirements. So uh, this bill is not a real heavy lift for those uh, only those permitted to practice law in uh, this sensitive row, for which, of course, they are compensated and paid. Uh, this is not a community service. Uh, this bill just aims to fortify our judiciary with experts, with experts on the bench for Pacific judges assigned to these very difficult family law dockets. In a heavy and often emotional, disproportionately pro se docket, all legal professionals must be um, intimately familiar with best practices and underlying scientific understanding required to pass a fair and considered judgment on custody and visitation when child abuse and domestic violence disclosures come to the court without an investigation such as in the um, child need of um, assistance proceedings. As mandated reporters have had fewer instructions with children, judges are the first and of course, the last line of defense. And neither judges nor um, best interest attorneys or mandated reporters and trainings listed for the family law university are specific to important topics, but not specifically on point with the work group recommendations codified in this bill. As Malcolm Gladwell noted in his recent book, uh, Talking to Strangers, there is an underlining problem with truth default theory uh, where we are more likely to believe the less horrendous story, all things being equal. Uh, it is, uh, it's so much more easier to imagine someone is lying to game the system than someone who seems normal in court and in public uh, to be, who could possibly be a monster in private. Uh, this miscalculation occurs in the criminal context, but perhaps more nefariously in, child, in family law where we want to assume parents would not never harm their children. Uh, this bill just merely highlights some of the horrors depicted in uh, Allen versus Farrell. Uh, if you've seen it, it's an ongoing uh, HBO documentary about parental alienation claims used to hide uh, child sexual abuse. The law in Maryland was updated to reflect the concerns um, raised in similar cases back in the early 1990s but the training for judges to understand the, dy the dynamics hasn't really caught up with the law. And in fact, the law has been hijacked by this uh, same disapproval, dis disproven theory that was inspired in part by the arguments raised uh, during this case. After 30 years, we are learning more about the facts behind the circumst those circumstances, but the Maryland judiciary is not prioritizing similar concerns raised here now. Maryland is not very unique at all. Uh, judges across the country have similar laws to apply to the facts, but they are hesitant to get, get at the facts in abuse disclosures because there is usually not an investigation in family court. And judges as well, so-called experts and court-appointed counsel are also not adequately trained. And when the legislature pushes for those reforms, the judiciary fails to even recognize the problem, let alone confront it head on. Uh, of course, we wouldn't be here um, if the judiciary was willing to fully examine the problem themselves. 
the legislative uh, policymaking body of the state must act uh, because they don't. What higher priority uh, do we have than preventing the state uh, from sending child sexual assault victims and domestic violence survivors back under the thumb of their abusers? In uh, Allen versus Farrell, uh, the alleged abuser said the allegations were bizarre concoctions of a woman scorn. While the survivors articulated at an older age uh, that I wished I had been stronger and didn't cr crumble under pressure, the other party conceded that if I, were, if I felt weird, it was my fault and I was doing something wrong. And I get why people can't believe it because I couldn't believe it. Uh, the, the dynamic is familiar for protective parents in Maryland this is not just uh, New York in the 1990s. This is family law courts everywhere, except where there are trained judges and best interest attorneys. Even their problem arise, uh, but uh, they are recognized and prioritized. The lack of training of judges, uh, best interest attorneys, and notably blocking the transparency of training materials under a court issue rule created an atmosphere that allows these abuse cases to fester and the scene in depicted on HBO is far too familiar of a scenario that plays out day after day in every jurisdiction across the country and uh, the state with less fanfare, of course, less legal assistance. Um, please read uh, the appeal in the Allen case that notes, while evidence in the support of the allegations remain inconclusive, it is clear that the investigation of the charges in and of itself could not have left Dylan unaffected. Alarmingly and tellingly, the dissent provides that Mr. Allen is being strained and alienated from his son by the current custody and visitation arrangement. Mr. Allen would welcome Satcho by hugging him, telling him how much he loved him and how much he missed him. Evidence of a friendly relationship with the child does not exonerate um, against accusations of sexual abuse against another child, even behaviors of a child who was abused themselves, doesn't on, on their face clear the allegations of wrongdoing. Investigations are required for a uh, child in need of assistance cases, which are to be completed within a few months. But under family law disputes, uh, a simple analysis of the expressions of a child seem to be sufficient to contradict other evidence for some judges. That's why we need adequate training in Maryland this year. Who wants our vulnerable children to fall off this judicial learning curve? Our children and victims of domestic violence deserve so much more. Uh, for these reasons, I respectfully ask my wonderful colleagues to vote favorably on SB uh, 675. And I'd like to turn it over to uh, my witnesses who are uh, experts in this area and could speak further on this. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Senator Lee. Uh, so next we have, we'll go to your primary witness, and it, that's uh, Dr. Saunders. So Dr. Saunders is the primary witness. You'll have five minutes, and the floor is yours. Dr. Saunders, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, can you hear me? We can. Excellent. Uh, we cannot see you, but we can hear you. So. Uh, All right. Let me... Uh... Okay, let me get the camera going here. There you go. Excellent, so the floor is yours. Good afternoon, Chairman Smith, Vice Chair Waldstriker, and members of the committee. Thank you very much for this opportunity to voice my strong support for Senate Bill 675. My name is Daniel Saunders. I'm Professor Emeritus of Social Work at the University of Michigan. My research, teaching, and service have focused on the problems of dating and domestic violence, known as DV, over my 45-year career. Included in my work has been the training of professionals, including judges and attorneys, and research on professionals' beliefs and behavior, <clears throat> including judges and attorneys. You probably know how much we need to focus on custody and visitation determinations in domestic violence cases, they need to be determined with extreme care. Victims and children risk serious harm if sole or joint custody is awarded to a violent parent, or if an abusive parent is poorly supervised in visits with children. 
Too often professionals do not detect the violence or when they do, don't adequately protect victims. In our survey of 1,100 professionals, uh, judges and private attorneys reported less knowledge of post-separation violence screening for DV and danger assessment compared to other professionals. Judges were also more likely to believe that domestic abuse victims try to alienate the child from the other parent compared to other professionals. In Allison Marill's study, her survey of judges showed that they did not understand several true-false questions. For example, the statement, there is an established psychological profile of women who become involved with abuse of men, which is false. <clears throat> There's a tremendous amount of gender bias in our courts, and that's been documented through numerous studies at the national, state, and local level. This bias uh, is shown in the tendency to disbelieve or minimize the accounts that abuse victims have, to punish women for reporting abuse, and to hold them to a higher standard than fathers. We now have domestic violence training mandated for judges in 22 states, plus Guam and DC. And judges who received such training in the Muriel study were twice as likely to give battered mothers sole physical custody. Judges with more DV knowledge in her study were more likely to grant sole physical and legal custody to the battered mother. In Peter Jaffe's evaluation of a national training program, judges overestimated their skills and competence before the training and several months after the training most of them saw that the ways that they had changed were in areas such as victim safety and batterer accountability there are numerous strengths in senate bill 675 that will help fill the gaps in knowledge and practice for example information will be given that child abuse may have occurred even without an indicated finding or with substantiation, as we refer to it here in Michigan. Coercive and controlling forms of abuse will be covered, including litigation abuse. <clears throat> These forms of abuse can occur without physical abuse, yet can be extremely harmful to victims and their children. There will be the potential impacts of bias covered as well, and uh, in particular, gender bias. Ongoing education is very much needed to make sure that gender bias is reduced. There'll be information on lethality assessment, and that is crucial to prevent the most tragic outcomes in custody visitation cases. There are some risk factors, for example, that are counterintuitive and are not apparent to most judges and attorneys. Uh, there'll be extensive and ongoing training because essential knowledge in the field has expanded greatly in the last few decades and continues to evolve. The bill further requires some other essential elements. Uniform screening to identify child and domestic violence is very much needed. And then in order for danger and lethality assessment, there are tools that will measure both lethality, other tools that will measure recurrence of violence and severe violence. The uh, Maryland Domestic Violence Coalition helped to develop the lethality assessment program for law enforcement. It's a very brief measure for law enforcement. The um, danger assessment instrument is a longer instrument on which the LAP was derived. And it has been used in a variety of settings, including family court, hospitals, and shelters. Then there are also separate instruments Hi. that would need to be used to assess the risk for non-lethal violence. In summary, Senate Bill 675 contains many essential elements for enhancing the safety of Maryland citizens, Thank you for letting me give these comments, and I look forward to answering any questions you might have. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dr. Saunders. And next, we'll uh, turn to Ms. Kenny. You're up. Okay. Can you hear me? You can. Yes. Good to see you again. Okay. Hi. Um, so my name is Annie Kenny, and I am a single mother to three daughters from St. Mary's County. And several years ago, I learned that my ex-husband was abusing one of my daughters. He was indicted on felony child sex abuse charges, and he is now a tier three registered sex offender for life. Um, four years after his arrest, though, I'm still in family court. 
Um, and it's important to note that before I ever stepped foot in family court, before I ever met my judge, my husband had already been convicted. Um, we already knew that he had abused a child. He was already a registered sex offender. There were no allegations at play here. Um, but yet it wasn't until my third court hearing that the judge even used the word abuse. The first two hearings, he referred to the abuse as demeaning, uh, humiliating. He, he never actually referenced it as abuse at all in the first two hearings. And to this day, he's still never said the words sexual abuse. Um, somewhere along the line, we learned that my ex-husband was trying to gain unsupervised access to my other two children. Um, he was even found sleeping alone with them when he was supposed to be supervised by his mother. And instead of being able to identify that as very concerning and grooming behavior, um, my judge told him he was being stupid and told me that I should still send the kids back. Um, you know, let's try this again, which, you know, of course I couldn't do. Um, a few years into the process, the Maryland State Police actually granted me an unrestricted permit to carry a handgun um, because they identified me to be in danger. Um, a child ad advocacy group that got involved in my case, they sent me for a lethality assessment and I scored a nine out of 11. So the Maryland State Police and domestic violence experts deemed me to be in danger when it came to my ex-husband and family court was telling me to co-parent with him. Um, he had daily phone calls with me. I was supposed to keep him up to date on their mental and physical health. Uh, we had joint birthday parties. And for over a year, I met him every single Friday evening at Burger King so he could have dinner with these kids. Um, the real thing is, I, I don't think my my judge um, had ill intent. I really don't. He's He's been kind to me. He's been compassionate to me. He doesn't indicate that he thinks I'm overreacting. Fine. Thank you. I just think that there's a lot of well-intentioned um, professionals in the family court system right now that just don't have enough knowledge to really be making these choices. Thank you for your time. Excellent. Thank you very much, Ms. Kenny. Good to see you again. Um, next, we'll have uh, Judge Bowles. Judge, I'm just going in order of uh, sign up here. Is this Judge here? There he is. I'm going to ask to unmute you. There you go. Try one more time. There's a screen pop up that says unmute. Oh, got it. There you go. Okay. Thank right. you. Thank you. Um, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to share my experience and my knowledge um, with this esteemed body today. As judges, we don't know what we don't know. I've served 20 years on the Kentucky Family Court. I've heard literally thousands of divorce and custody cases during these two decades. I now own a family law mediation practice and have mediated over 1,500 divorce and custody cases since I retired from the bench. I provided domestic violence and child abuse training through judicial colleges in 48 out of our 50 states and through the US Justice Department and the US State Department, I've trained judges in six foreign countries, including China, Bosnia, Kosovo, and most recently in, in Egypt. Custody and parenting access decisions are the most important decisions that our courts are called upon to make. The level of care they need, the children's developmental and emotional needs the impact on those children of the parents as role models, and most of all their safety are critical elements to their becoming self-sufficient, moral, and productive adults in our societies. Understanding domestic violence and child abuse as a field of study is critical to the evaluative process in making custody and parenting access decisions. In my experience, most judges making these decisions do not have sufficient training or the expert knowledge to assess the presence, the level, or the impact of their behaviors on children. 
Too often, judges delegate these inquiries to untrained, um, often biased law enforcement agencies or social service agencies. This leads to erroneous conclusions that if actions were not initiated by these interveners, that the behaviors failed to exist or didn't rise to the level that they're of consequence to the children. The standard for criminal accountability or the criminal threshold of domestic violence or abuse and the standard for removal of children Fine. are not synonymous. Okay. Well, Judge, you could briefly conclude. Sorry, we don't have a timer actually visibly, uh, you know, a visual display. So okay. we're relying on, on the voice of God here, but uh, okay. 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 I've, um, basically, just judicial training and knowledge on the impact of parents who use patterns of course of controlling behaviors um, impact children in so many ways. Um, those abusers are unable to understand and respond to children's needs because they will always put their needs primary. Um, they are not equal caregivers in the intact family before the separations. They're unwilling to compromise or communicate with the protective parent um, because of, of their ma typically male entitlement um, ideations. Um, the risk of physical and sexual assault on children by domestic violence batterers is 50 to 80 percent. So we can predict that over half of domestic violence offenders will, after separation, abuse either physically or sexually their children. It took the, and I'll just conclude because I know we're out of time. Two minutes is so quick. I trained for days on this issue with judges, but um, basically it took legislation for judges to even allow domestic violence into a custody action. It took our legislators to say the courts must consider domestic violence because judges didn't have the expertise or the knowledge to understand the impact of that violence on children who are exposed to that trauma in the home. Um, it's a complicated field. It requires lots of expertise in order to make these decisions. And so I uh, would certainly be in favor of of requiring judicial training. We don't, judges don't know what we don't know. Thank you. Excellent, thank you very much, Judge. Okay, next we'll uh, switch over to, to General Singh. Good to, good to see you. Good to see um, you as well, Mr. Chairman. I've got, I've got the flag you presented to me up here. So it's, a, it's a, it found a, a prominent place. And uh, yes. it's funny, it reminded me, I had a conversation with, uh, I told you, with, with uh, General Matlock. Uh, who, yes. Thanks, saying your praise and speak very highly. Anyway, well, um, you. good to see you. Good to uh, see you as well. Likewise. Um, well, so I'm just slightly different than um, a, a number of the folks that came before because I am a, a uh, sexual assault survivor. Um, my adverse childhood um, experiences score is five. And you would look at that and say, well, how did she do so well? And obviously it doesn't take into account um, the level of resiliency that a person can have. But, you know, my story from young, uh, when I was um, moved with my parents, um, I, I did not realize how um, really tough the environment was going to be. My mom um, would, you know, ver she would verbally abuse us in the sense that if you're doing the slurs and telling you that you, you're, you're not going to amount to anything, you're not going to do this. But the worst part is, that um, having to experience my older sister being sexually abused and then us having to go to family court and her being removed from the home and me being told that if I don't tell what my mom wanted me to tell, um, that I would be put out of my house. And here I am, you know, I was like 13 years old and what was I supposed to do? And I regret that day for really this moment in my life because I didn't stand up for my sister. And so she was removed from the home. We were in the same school without any explanation. And at no time did the court ever ask, um, would I be in any kind of danger? Would I be subject to the same? It was not asked. They were, they were basically said that, you know, it didn't happen. So they wanted her removed. I mean, it really was downplayed. And so when I think about what happened a couple of years after that, 
when I was sexually abused by my brother in the same household, my mother there again, um, take, she took the side of you know, the abuser. And so when I think about what could have been done in that instance, I could have been saved. And I could have been saved by the court system had they thought to ask the right questions and had they removed me as well, thinking, you know, maybe this household is not the right thing. They didn't come in and do a home study. They didn't really take anybody else's word other than my mother's word against ours. And so what I would say is that if getting training helps to prevent someone going through what I went through, because I ultimately became homeless and thank God for the military, but I became homeless because I had to leave home. I mean, it's like, if the courts are not gonna believe me, why would I report this? And so this Hi. is what goes on. And I would say, we need to support this. We need to push for the training and we need to push to this level of um, awareness for folks. And I wanna thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me just to share my story. Yep. Thank you very much for, for taking the time and for sharing your story and um, your willingness to be here on behalf of this issue. Um, next, we will move on to uh, Ms. Uh, Villamar, you're up next. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chairman, and members of the committee. Uh, I'm the Chief Attorney of the Parental Defense Division of the Office of the Public Defender. We represent parents whose children have been separated from them by the Department of Social Services. These cases are called Children in Need of Assistance, or SENA cases. The judges who preside over family law cases involving custody disputes between parents are the same judges who preside over SENA cases because they do a rotation in the courts. And so the Public Defender's Office urges a favorable report with amendments because this bill requires the decision makers in these cases, the judges, to be trained so that they can make the most well-informed decisions possible for the families involved. There's a plethora of relatively new science and evidence-based information about the adverse childhood experiences and the long-term effects on child and adult victims of abuse and domestic violence. An educated bench is always a good thing, and given the gravity of the decisions they're called upon to make in these cases, proper training and updated training is critical. The amendments that we recommend are provided in the written testimony that I submitted to this committee. However, there is a, a big important um, amendment that I failed to include in that, and that is that magistrates should also be required to participate in this type of training. Because in family law cases, as well as in um, SINA cases, magistrates can often make um, the important decisions about temporary custody or make recommendations to the court about um, temporary custody. So what I would ask, I would respectfully request that magistrates be included in this bill as well. Um, and then the, the second um, amendment that I would like to highlight um, is that in the section regarding uh, informing the courts about the long-term effects of domestic violence on children who have witnessed it, I think that the judiciary, also the bench, also needs to be trained on why a parent or a partner who is the victim of domestic violence may choose not to leave or report the abuser, despite the fact that the children are being exposed to the domestic violence. Because it's often mistaken for a lack of good parenting or a lack of interest in being a good parent, when actually it is not often an indication of neglectful parenting. It's due to fear, it's due to, um, it's due to being uh, powerless in the relationship. But without the training on this aspect of domestic violence, judges may erroneously conclude that because uh, exposure to domestic violence adversely affects children, um. Uh, yes, then the non-abusive parent who does not leave is complicit in harming the children. And that is a misconception. So thank you for the opportunity to express my concerns. Um, I do urge that you um, give a favorable recommendation with amendments. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. And next we'll move over to Ms. Cooper. You're up. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, honorable members of the committee. Uh, my name is Camille Cooper. I am Vice President of Public Policy for RAIN. RAIN is um, the largest anti-sexual violence organization in the U.S. 
We created and operate the National Sexual Assault Hotline as well as the DOD Safe Helpline for military members around the globe. Um, I, in the interest of full disclosure, I did sit on this task force, the working group task force as a subject matter expert. Um, today, I am here in my capacity as Vice President of RAIN. We are supporting this bill, but asking for an amendment, which I will get to at the end of my testimony. At RAIN, um, we crossed over on our online hotline, we crossed over um, statistically, we now have more than 50% of the users on our online hotline are now minors. 67% of those are um, being abused by a family member and 79% are actually living with their abuser. Um, what we can see from 30,000 feet at RAIN is that child sexual abuse is an epidemic in this country and that our systems that are set up to protect children in these types of uh, intrafamilial child sexual abuse cases are not being protected. When we first started looking at this at the working group, um, we originally started with the idea of creating a specialized court, much like a veterans court or a drug court. So um, what you have before you in Senate Bill uh, 675 is actually um, much less restrictive on judges and also probably a lot less expensive than creating a, an entirely specialized docket or court uh, for judges. So it's a bit of a compromise already, 675. Um, we all know that judges make life-changing decisions for children in these types of cases. Um, the one thing I wanna stress is that when a, when a judge does not have the educational foundation to understand the complexities of trauma and the complexities and nuances of domestic violence and child abuse, um, that sometimes their mistakes actually lead to very, very um, harmful outcomes for children. Um, according to the Center for Judicial Excellence, about 772 children have been murdered by a divorcing or separating parent across the nation. And in some very disturbing national research by Joan Meyer from the George Washington University Law School, in cases where mothers are trying to protect their children, that have a, the children have alleged sexual abuse and the mother is trying to protect the child in the context of family court. Um, when the father uh, counter alleges parental alienation, the court is in, has only been protecting children um, percent of the time. So that tells you that children are really without a safety net here uh, in the court system. And I, I want to stress that um, it's not so much that we're being critical of judges, it's that we wanna empower them with the appropriate knowledge, training and skills to be able to sort of weed through um, these very complex and, and difficult cases. Um, the one thing I want to inform this committee about that no one's really touched on is that parental alienation was uh, a concoction of one man, his name was Richard Gardner, and um, he had some very sympathetic and apologetic views about child sexual abuse. He often uh, testified around the country in hundreds of cases on behalf of fathers that were accused of sexual abuse. And in those cases, he often recommended that the mother be punished for trying to protect the child um, and that custody be removed from her entirely. Um, he, um, he created- You're over time. So I just wanna, if you could just very briefly uh, conclude. This, this gets to my amendment. Um, Basically what he did is he took all of the symptoms a child would um, exhibit if they had um, post-traumatic stress disorder and he concocted a theory that those same symptoms were parental alienation. So it's a, it's a very circular thing that happens with children. They get sort of caught in this, um, uh, in this deceptive label that he created. So I would request an amendment to the bill on page three, line 21, um, subparagraph two, um, I would ask that you please amend it to say the misuse, misapplication, and unreliability of the use of parental alienation in cases involving allegations of DV, child abuse, and sex abuse. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, great. So that concludes the testimony for the proponents of the bill. We'll now switch over to the opposition panel, and we have Ms. Ruth. Uh, you are up next. Hmm. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee, my name is Lori Ruth and I'm the Le legal director at the Women's Law Center in Maryland. Um, I was also on the work group that um, I think Senator Lee's bill is attempting honorably to address. And I'm really sorry to have to be here today opposing this bill um, of Senator Lee's, our, our very good friend. 
uh, you know, listening to the testimony and support, we agree, I can honestly say we agree with many of the things that were expressed here today. And I'm terribly sorry for Ms. Kenny and Ms. Singh's experiences with the court system. It happens. We're involved in cases like that. And it's really, really difficult uh, to figure out what to do. But this bill is not the proper answer in our view. We think it's a it's flawed for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, specifically uh, in terms of the judge's training, there are, are concerns, and I think there's been a prior bill this year about this, that putting this in a statute makes it much more static. It's not as easy to revise as new uh, so social science comes up and whatnot. It wouldn't be as easy for the judiciary to turn and add that or subtract something. And so, you know, we think that it's more appropriate that it stay within the purview of the judiciary. Now, I will agree completely that the judiciary um, was not very forthcoming to the work group and they wouldn't share their curriculum, which left us in a bit of a bind in that work group about what they're actually learning. So, so the premise that they should be learning this new social science is good, but I worry about having it in this statute. Um, secondarily, um, I really urge you to read the Maryland Network Against Domestic Violence's written testimony about the use of the lethality assessment. You know, Dr. Saunders mentioned a couple of instruments, and I'm aware of those instruments. I've done a lot of work with lethality assessment, but um, this bill suggests that there is a product out there called the lethality assessment that should be used in a court system when it hasn't been validated for that. It's only been validated for first responders um, at the moment or you know, soon thereafter of the abuse to talk to them about their level of danger at that moment to encourage them to get services. It hasn't been validated for anything other than heterosexual couples, not same-sex couples. And um, we can't tell from the statute, the bill as proposed, who's supposed to be implementing this, who's supposed to be doing it with somebody in the court or, or to what end. Um, and, and I think Time. it really muddies the waters. Uh, lastly, I don't know that 60 hours is the appropriate amount of time, as I've said in my testimony on other things. Um, whatever the best practices is, we certainly support for both the judges and the BIAs, um, but I don't know that 60 is right from a cost or time perspective. So I have other reasons we oppose this bill as written, but for now, I'll just urge an unfavorable report. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Ms. Ruth. And next, we'll move on to Mr. Aikenbaum. You're up next. Hello? There you go. We can hear you. Hi. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, my name is Jeff Aikenbaum. I'm a Maryland uh, parent. Um, training judges who preside over childhood custody cases involving all forms of emotional and physical abuse is certainly a worthy goal. However, that's not the only goal of Senate Bill 675. This bill promotes the indoctrination of judges in a narrow social agenda that discredits anything that doesn't fit into this agenda. I'm a father of three alienated children with whom I have not seen for three years. My children are among an estimated 66,000 moderately to severely alienated children in Maryland. This bill proposes to train judges that parental alienation is junk and that my children's alienation was fabricated to deflect domestic violence accusations, which it was not. The truth is parental alienation is three times as prevalent as autism and there is 35 years of clinical, legal and scientific research that confirms its existence. This research also demonstrates the lifelong damaging consequences to children for parental alienation that are as great as in physical and sexual abuse. And the written testimony that I have provided gives a lot of um, sources for uh, uh, this research. This bill is the result of a work group that from its inception was biased against parental alienation. It did not invite even one parental alienation expert to testify before it. Instead, it relied upon the statements of Joan Mayer, Mayer is a lawyer, she's not a scientist. Her research about parental alienation is replete with factual errors and ad hominem attacks. Her watershed study, which has captured the attention of the media, was not even peer reviewed in a North American journal. 
Furthermore, it was utterly refuted by a peer-reviewed study in the American Psychological Association Journal of Psychology, Public Policy, and Law. In that study, every one of the mayor's conclusions was scrupulously tested by actual scientists. This study identified at least 30 problems with the research that invalidates the results and conclusions. It's disgraceful that a work group that was charged to protect Maryland children from abuse could discount the very real abuse of parental alienation. It's shameful that Senate Bill 675 and other similar custody bills that are being proposed based upon this uh, 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 work group are being taken seriously. Judicial, judicial training is necessary. Time. Judicial training is necessary, but only training that includes the validity of parental alienation and whose curriculum is not controlled by neuro special interest groups. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Much, uh, Mr. Wiggenbaum, and Senator put forward a bill, and so we will consider it, and we'll consider it seriously. Um, all right, um, Ms. Smith, you're up next. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Vice Chair and committee members, and hello, Senator Lee. I am also equally um, reticent to oppose this bill on behalf of the Family and Juvenile Law Section Council of the Maryland State Bar Association because there are um, so many good aspects to what everybody who is a proponent of this bill has already testified to. And I know that Senator Lee has only the best intentions with this bill. Unfortunately, uh, on behalf of section counsel for the Maryland State Bar Association Family and Juvenile Law Section, I do have to oppose it. Um, we are opposing on fairly narrow grounds. We absolutely acknowledge that the issue of abuse in custody matters is complicated and is not always adequately addressed at family law trials. We support efforts to improve that process. And actually we have been active in supporting other legislation before this esteemed committee, as well as um, the House Judiciary Committee on just this topic of how to make sure judges absolutely on the record consider these important issues in family law cases. And we absolutely support training for judges and child counsel. It's just a matter of that we don't support mandating certain aspects of that very detailed training in a statute. And I would echo all of the comments made by Ms. Ruth that we would prefer this to happen internally through the judiciary with transparency um, and perhaps in a rule committee setting as opposed to in a statute because I'd hate to have to come back every year after year after year and update our statutes as the science and the issues change. In addition, I just wanted to point out the 60 hour requirement for child counsel. Uh, we do as attorneys who are boots on the ground in these cases, um, some of us are BIAs or child privilege attorneys. Um, that may create a bar to getting really good, solid, um, experienced and qualified attorneys who are willing to put their names on the list for the courts to appoint as child counsel um, if they just can't get the 60 hours together um, in addition to running a, you know, being partners at their firms and having um, a very full practice. So I, I don't know whether 60 hours is the right amount, but it, it is a, a large amount. So I would um, just Fine. say that as a concern. We urge an unfavorable report. Excellent. Thank you very much, Ms. Smith. And with that, that'll conclude the testimony for Senate Bill 675. Uh, turn to the committee for questions. And the cold streak continues. All right, with that, that'll end the hearing for Senate Bill 675. Cold bench here today. Um, thank you very much, Senator Lee. Thank you to the panelists and uh, have a good evening. Thank you. All right, with that, we'll head into the final two bills of the day. We'll start off with Senate Bill 686. I am the lead sponsor for that bill. So for the record, Senator Smith here to present Senate Bill 686. Um, this bill seeks to address a problem that uh, basically was born out of the pandemic. Um, so now that we're in the midst, they're still very much in the midst of the pandemic, condos, HOAs, um, have, who usually typically held their, their meetings in person, um, have now shifted and they have to have them through other means and other platforms like uh, Zoom and Facebook, Google Meet 
and sometimes even Facebook. Um, and so there's an ambiguity in the law as to whether uh, these organizations are able to do this, although many of them have adapted, still there, there still exists a lot of ambiguity. Um, there's an example that I'll give you a kind of a vignette, um, which I think is a good case study for uh, why this bill is necessary. There's a, a property in, in my district where the board used to have uh, regular meetings in a clubhouse, um, but very few people would show up. And so when the pandemic hit, uh, they struggled to kind of reinterpret their uh, 20 year old uh, bylaws. And so they just went ahead and pressed on and they started doing business over Zoom. And the silver lining in all of this is that more people showed up and more people got involved um, and actually ended up being a, a net gain and benefit for the association and a safer means of communication. Um, so that's just one example of how the HOAs and the co-ops across our state are kind of shifting the way that they do business um, through the pandemic. Obviously, several states have uh, yeah, created or uh, had an uh, executive order for a state of emergency and several measures uh, allowing for organizations such as this to meet uh, remotely have been in place. But when those uh, states of emergency cease and those executive orders are rescinded, um, there will be no protection left uh, after that happens. So um, this bill basically does a couple things. It's cross filed with uh, Senator Holmes in the house it just ensures that homeowners uh, uh homeowner associations condos uh co-ops can meet virtually um and it prescribes some of the conditions in which they can do it it's pretty straightforward um and with that i'll uh, i'll rest and turn over to my panel and uh, ask the committee for a favorable report my first panelist i'll see there uh i'll just go with mr friedman you'll go first Hold on, hold on, let me unmute you here. Hold on. There you go. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, for bringing the chair and Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee, for the opportunity to testify. I uh, would like to testify on behalf of the Community Association Institute's Legislative Action Committee in favor of Senate Bill 686, one amendment. Um, so, as you may already know, CAI represents uh, individuals and professionals who work with condominium associations homeowners associations, community associations, and co-ops throughout the state of Maryland. Um, and as the chairman mentioned in his uh, testimony, since the pandemic hit, um, we've talked with a lot of groups about whether or not they're allowed to conduct virtual meetings. Um, the meetings are obviously necessary in order for them to conduct their business, hold elections, um, adopt budgets, take care of contracts, things of that nature. Um, and so just as the legislature has had to um, adopt, these groups need to do the same. Uh, so as the chairman mentioned, a lot of groups that we've talked to have actually gone ahead and uh, started conducting virtual meetings, and we've seen a lot of positive results. Um, mo first and foremost is the uh, increased participation um, from the members, and then also reduced costs of, um, of hosting these meetings, uh, flexibility and scheduling. Um, however, some groups still are holding off conducting their meetings, um, and they would they're looking for guidance and would really benefit from having the virtual meeting process prescribed by law. Um, our only amendment that we're asking for is to make this emergency legislation uh, so that it would go into effect as soon as possible. Um, during yesterday's hearing in the House, the House bill sponsor, Delegate Holmes, uh, accepted our amendment as a friendly amendment. Um, and then just looking beyond the pandemic, uh, if we can ever get to that point, uh, this bill will continue to, to benefit community associations by allowing uh, their meetings to be held virtually. Um, both Virginia and the District of Columbia have already adopted similar uh, emergency legislation and Maryland has the chance to be the first to make this type of legislation permanent. Um, so with that, we ask for a favorable, favorable report on Senate Bill 686 uh, with the amendment that it be enacted as emergency legislation or at the very least moved up from the October 1st start date. Again, thanks to the committee and happy to take any questions. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Friedman. And we'll move on to Mr. Thompson. You're up next. And thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, and honorable members of the committee. Thomas Thompson on behalf of CAI as well in support of this bill. And while we did have that initial single um, amendment to this bill, we actually have a more nuanced amendment as well. And that was only uncovered as we had a robust discussion about this bill yesterday um, in the House. So the bill drafters slightly changed the language that CAI presented, and it's in the opening phrase of A1 for each type of common ownership community. So as you can see, when you go through the bill, page two is co-ops, page three is condos, and page five are homeowners associations. And we're seeking to have these virtual hearings 
in all those settings because it is important and it does promote robust discussion of issues in our communities and, and brings about better results. But the opening phrase of each one of those sections currently reads, quote, notwithstanding language contained in the governing documents, end quote. And that is going to become a little bit problematic because as we presented it to the bill drafter, it should read, and this is how the rest of the condo, HOA, and common ownership law reads, except as otherwise provided in this title or in the governing documents of the Council of Unit Owners. Why is that distinction important? Most governing documents, as, as the chairman noted, are fairly old um, and they only provide for meetings either in person or um, by proxy. And they never contemplated this type of meeting. Why? Because the internet quite frankly wasn't even existed when most of these communities were constructed. So we tried to have consistent pattern language throughout uh, the Homeowners Association Acts and the Common Ownership Community Acts to be uniform and to make their application in these self-governing bodies easier to do. And so we think if you just give a one of each section that the board of directors may authorize this type of behavior. They don't have to authorize it, but they may. I think we would get a great benefit in this bill for these communities moving forward and, and more robust participation. And for that, we support the bill and we thank you for your consideration. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Tomset. Uh, now let's see, that concludes the testimony for Senate Bill 686. We'll switch over to the committee for questions. Senator Hedelman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I think this is a fine bill offered by the chairman. I'm going to, I'm going to, if he'll indulge me, I just want to point out, um, I don't know if this has ever happened in the committee, but Eli Friedman is a constituent and his mom just testified in the hearing before this one, Laurie Ruth. So I want to welcome him. I don't know if this is his inaugural time testifying in Annapolis, but great to see uh, my 11th district constituent. It is. Thank you so much, Senator. It's a JPR first, so there you go. Mom and son, <laughs> back to back. <laughs> Doing the people's Thank work. All right, excellent. All right, um, looking around the room for additional questions. Okay, excellent. With that, that'll conclude the hearing for Senate Bill 686. Thank you all very much. Good to see you all. Uh, we'll now move on to Senate Bill uh, 834, and I'm the lead sponsor there. So good afternoon, committee members, for the last bill of the day. Senator Smith here to present Senate Bill 834. So I got this idea, uh, the idea for this bill uh, through an organization, an association that my firm is a part of, which is the Metropolitan Employment Lawyers Association, which is in Wheela. And it was during one of these meetings that actually uh, I learned of a measure that passed in New York and California, and then Montgomery County had actually done the same thing, which greatly improved upon our employment discrimination and anti-sexual uh, harassment law. So remember, we all remember, I think all of us were actually here in the assembly when um, under the leadership of Speaker Bush and Senate President Mike Miller, um, they developed a commission on workplace harassment. And remember the work that that highly publicized report, and then we moved forward with implementing a number of those recommendations. Uh, however, uh, workplace harassment is still a widespread problem, and there still uh, need to be some strong protections uh, put in place. And this is something that's become all more apparent during the pandemic, especially for low-wage women. So nearly two-thirds two of low-wage workers in Maryland are women, uh, and they're especially at risk given the stark power imbalances. This is ripped from a, a piece of testimony that you'll hear a little bit later on, the power imbalances uh, that exist within those workplaces. And when you're uh, in a situation in which the pandemic's going, uh, job prospects are low, um, and tenuous and precarious, um, that just, again, alters the power balance and opens the door for greater uh, uh, opportunity for abuse and harassment. According to the Equal uh, Employment Opportunity Commission, the EEOC, at least one in four women have been sexually harassed in the workplace. Um, and workplace harassment is alleged in nearly 30% of all the complaints filed with the EEOC. Again, um, not very many women uh, report this type of harassment because uh, of the precarious nature of their employment status. So uh, the Senate Bill 834 seeks to clarify the, uh, that harassment can occur under state law, even if it doesn't meet what the courts have previously called the severe and pervasive standard. So what this bill does is it alters the state government's article of harassment relating to employment discrimination. So under the bill, harassment includes oral, written, or physical conduct, whether or not the conduct would be considered sufficiently severe or pervasive under precedent applied 
to harassment claims. So we're talking about that judicial uh, interpretation. Um, and it does the same thing for sexual harassment. So the bill uh, as drafted, we'll talk a little bit later about what needs to be cleaned up and some of the forthcoming amendments that I'm sure that the Women's Law Center and CASA um, will speak to. But it also breaks into a second uh, definition for sexual harassment. And we'll clean that up, I think, through amendments uh, that are forthcoming. So a little bit of background. Um, Title 20 of the state government article does not currently define harassment or sexual harassment. These are judicially defined terms, as I mentioned before. So Title 20 um, does define uh, harassment. It includes harassment based on race, color, religion, ancestry, or national origin, sex, age, marital status, sexual orientation, gender, identity, or disability, and retains its judicially determined meaning, except to the extent it is expressly or impliedly changed. So that's the way it reads in the statute. You'll find it in the supplements, not even, it's not in the book. It's so new, actually, that it's only exists in our supplements. So in interpreting Maryland's state employment discrimination laws, the courts oftentimes, or all the time, they'll seek guidance from the federal cases, which have interpreted Title VII uh, in kind of an unfortunate manner. Uh, so in evaluating these, uh, whether conduct is severe or pervasive um, to create something that's a, an intimidating or a hostile work environment, a number of the lower courts have interpreted the severe uh, or pervasive standard uh, so narrowly that the conduct that anyone on this committee would find to be egregious is not considered. So it doesn't fall under this judicially uh, determined, this, this constructed definition of severe and pervasive. Um, so the testimony today, uh, actually it was, it, was, it was really enlightening because um, I think the Maryland uh, Women's Law Center and the Women's, National Women's Law Center in CASA did a fantastic job and kind of pulling out some of the case law and some of the vignettes of what was not considered severe and pervasive enough. I encourage the committee to actually just read those because I think you would all be baffled and aghast to see that some of these uh, instances just didn't meet that, uh, that judicially construed definition. So um, with that, I'll move on to just a couple of the logistical concerns that I'm sure we'll be able to work through, but just wanted to flag for the committee um, if sexual harassment is defined in uh, Title 20, uh, the definition can't conflict with what we've got in the state uh, personnel and pensions article. So um, another thing we've got going on is that it, there are some definitions, right? So the term sexual harassment appears in our statute with the state personnel and pensions article. Um, it also appears, um, it appears there because of the training that we established that came out of that commission. Um, and so there are some kind of, it, there's some weird definitional um, things that we're going to have to remedy if we change this law with the statute. Um, so we just have to make sure that it flag that so that everything's consistent throughout the two parts of our different statutes and the two different articles. Also, uh, in Maryland, the MCCR, um, the Commission on Civil Rights, and the EEOC have a work share agreement, meaning that the two agencies work together when processing employment discrimination claims. So a Maryland employee does not have to file with both agencies. Instead, they can, uh, they can file their claim with either or uh, and indicate that they want to cross file their claim. You can do that as well. So if, this, if we were to adopt this lower standard, the work share agreement um, might not work. And so we can bring in the, the commission to kind of work through those logistical problems as well. That's just another obstacle that uh, I'd like to flag for the committee. Uh, additionally, uh, the training, um, if, we, if we change this definition, the training is going to have to be reflected with that new definition as well um, as we move forward. So you'll see these forthcoming amendments from the Women's Law uh, Center, the Women's Law Center for uh, Maryland and nationally, MCASA. I, I consider all those amendments that I've read through, at least that I had time to look at, to be friendly. And I suspect that we're going to have to pull together a small work group um, with the Commission on Civil Rights. Um, we'll get Mr. Goldsmith involved, uh, you know, Mrs. Ms. Siri, Ms. Jordan, and we'll knock this out, Ms. Johnson, and, and we'll, we'll be able to kind of work through some of these problems. So with that, um, I would ask the committee for a favorable report and I'll turn it over to my panelists. Um, and first up as the primary, we'll have Mr. Goldsmith. Um, since I learned of this uh, piece of this idea from you, uh, you're the primary witness and, and you'll get five minutes. Thank you, Chair Smith. I'm Laser Goldsmith, principal of the Goldsmith Law Firm. I've been practicing employment law for over 30 years, uh, nearly 30 in Maryland. And I'm here representing the Metropolitan Washington Employment Lawyers Association, MAWILA, which is a professional association of over 300 attorneys of which I'm a member of the executive board. MAWILA is a local affiliate of the National Employment Lawyers Association, 
the largest professional membership organization in the country, comprised of lawyers who represent workers in employment, labor, and civil rights disputes. Mawila supports SB 834 because it could have an important effect on the ability of employees to enforce their statutory rights to bring discrimination complaints in the Maryland and federal courts. Our voluntary bar association contains the lawyers whom a Maryland employee is most likely to call upon when she's the victim of workplace harassment. It's our job to determine which cases we believe are appropriate to bring into the Maryland or federal courts under state law, and then to try to obtain just results for our clients. In a series of decisions beginning in the 1980s, the United States Supreme Court came to adopt a definition of workplace harassment. It focused on requirements that to support a lawsuit, harassment had to be both subjectively abusive to the victim and objectively severe or pervasive. The bill before you would alter only the objective aspect of the test for determining if harassment is sufficiently severe. Under existing codified law in Maryland, the term harassment specifically retains, uh, this is a quote, retains the judicially determined meaning except to the extent it is expressly or impliedly changed in the subtitle. Therefore, in implementing, in implementing the anti-discrimination provisions in the state government article, Maryland and federal courts can currently be expected to apply that 1980s Supreme Court standard for determining what conduct is objectively sufficient to cause actionable workplace harassment. Wheeler maintains that loosening this objectively severe or pervasive element of the existing judicial standard would better serve the people of Maryland as the chair well stated. While the bill under consideration would replace part of the judicially created standard, the objectively severe or pervasive requirement is by no means a radical departure from current law. Indeed, the language that replaces the objectively severe or pervasive test simply reflects reliance and emphasis on other pronouncement of the pronouncements of the US Supreme Court and other courts. Thus, the standard set forth in this bill, like those recently adopted in New York State and recently in Montgomery County under its human relations ordinance, emanates from the landmark on call case and many, many others. In those cases, courts have reiterated repeatedly that petty slights, trivial inconveniences, and minor annoyances are not significant enough to permit any recover, recovery for workplace harassment. So here, the mirror image of that proposition is wisely advanced. Harassment that indeed does reach beyond petty slights, minor annoyances, and trivial inconveniences would be legally sufficient to sustain a case so long as the facts satisfy other requirements of the standard. The experience of our members and clients teaches us that this revised standard would render it less likely that a seriously abusive work environment will be found insufficient to allow the victim her day in court and allow for greater predictability and uniformity in the law. This is because the discretion afforded to trial judges under the current standard enables each particular judge to apply their own sensibility of whether objectively uh, it's to be the particular facts are severe or pervasive. While the proposed law retains an objective element for the individual judge, it narrows the wide discretion somewhat by declaring that the objective test is whether a reasonable victim would consider the conduct to be worse than mere petty slights, trivial inconveniences, and minor annoyances. In this way, the standard would shift the emphasis to some degree from whether the judge believes the conduct was objectively severe enough or pervasive enough to whether the judge, or, or in some cases the jury, once the case gets that far, believes that it was objectively reasonable for the victim to view what happened as more than just petty slights, trivial inconveniences, and minor annoyances. Remember that both standards require that the victim subjectively views the environment as abusive or hostile in addition. Any argument that this change would open the floodgates to uh, unmeritorious litigation is itself without merit. Judges would retain the ability to dismiss cases where the alleged employer conduct amounts only to a petty slight, trivial inconvenience, or minor annoyance. The reported case annals are replete with rulings that can provide definition showing what those mean. Still, eliminating the requirement that harassment must be severe or pervasive would provide Marylanders with an increased degree of protection against unlawful harassment in the workplace, and we therefore urge a favorable report. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Goldsmith. And uh, I neglected to mention that um, in response, the Chamber of Commerce would, would definitely be a part of the, I see their testimony and understand. I think that some of the amendments that will be discussed could help assuage some of their concerns, but definitely look to have them as part of the conversation as well. Um, okay, uh, next we will move on to Ms. Jordan, you're up. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee. I'm Lisa Jordan with the Maryland Coalition Against Sexual Assault. We're here in strong support of Senate Bill 834, which would really bring the definition of sexual harassment into the 21st century. It was my great honor to serve on the, the Workplace Harassment Commission appointed by the Mikes. And I think that the commission is now over, but all of us knew that that was a first step in an ongoing effort to in, increase people's um, ability to have workplaces that were free of harassment, including sexual harassment. And that's exactly what Senate Bill 834 does. It effectively repeals dated and offensive case law that limits access to justice for employees who've been sexually harassed. Um, you, you heard Chairman Smith, you know, it's, it's uh, quite a, a privilege to be working with him on this because he's such a fabulous uh, sponsor and, and answers many of the legal questions as he presents the bill. He also made reference to, we had some suggested amendments, and I would just say as a matter of uh, being plain spoken in our law and easy to understand that it, it might be appropriate to simply say the conduct need not be per pervasive and severe, just be very straightforward with that. Um, I think that there is, uh, unfortunately, this expectation that it's okay to have a little bit of harassment and that's acceptable if it's not per pervasive and severe. And that's what we need to get away from. And frankly, that's what many of our workers expect these days. I think that people have grown up now into the hashtag Me Too era. There is a change in what people are expecting in the workplace. And if you look at some of the, the stories they are phenomenal. A, a supervisor entering the men's room frequently when the plaintiff was in the restroom alone, asking, you know, ah, alone at last after pretending to lock the door, using a magnifying glass on the employee's crotch, saying, where is it? Where is it? Um, saying, they bump together and saying, you only do that so you can touch me and also saying one time confined in a dark room, was it as good for you as it was for me? Attempting to force himself into a one person revolving door, all together, those things all together for one person by, uh, by their coworker were found not severe and pervasive. And that's simply no longer what we expect of our workplaces. So there are other examples. I, I urge you to read them. And the Maryland Coalition Against Sexual Assault urges a favorable report on Senate Bill 834. Excellent. Thank you, Ms. Jordan. Uh, next we will have Ms. Johnson. Thank you, Chair Smith and committee members, Andrea Johnson from the National Women's Law Center. I'm also a proud resident of Silver Spring and a constituent of, of Senator Smith. Um, the National Women's Law Center strongly supports the intent of SB 834, this intent to reject the severe pervasive standard, which some courts, including in the Fourth Circuit where Maryland resides, have interpreted in really harmful and outdated ways, um, such that cases involving conduct that most of us would find egregious harassment are thrown out and not given a full and fair hearing. That includes examples like uh, Lisa just brought up, but also when a worker was repeatedly making sexual comments towards another worker over a year and suggesting she be spanked, court found that that was not severe or pervasive. The standard has been particularly harmful for women of color because under the standard, what courts do is they parse apart and isolate and minimize the intertwined sex and race aspects of harassing conduct that a woman of color might experience instead of viewing the conduct in its totality. Because of this problematic severe pervasive standard, we're seeing uh, states and cities across the country rejecting the standard, including, as you mentioned, most recently in Montgomery County, but also New York, California, and New York City actually re rejected the standard back in 2016. We're seeing states from Virginia to New Jersey to Oregon this session working in similar legislation to this, recognizing that this really gets at the heart um, of addressing the problem of pervasive harassment throughout our workplaces. Uh, the language in SBA 34 is not as expansive as the language that has uh, passed in New York or California, as this bill rejects the unreasonably high or pervasive high severe pervasive standard, but otherwise still follows very closely the federal law definition to um, Laser's point is not a, a, a grand departure from federal law. Um, while we strongly support the goal of this bill, we feel courts and employers would benefit if amendments were added to further clarify what 
is the standard for when conduct rises to the level of harassment and to provide guiding rules and factors to guide courts evaluation and help ensure a fair unbiased hearing for employers and employees. We're concerned that without these amendments, the, the courts might fall into the same analytical pitfalls as under severe pervasive and, and find that you know, other language in the bill, they'll just end up kind of interpreting that in the same way as severe pervasive. So we provided some detailed amendments in our written testimony to really refocus courts on what was intended to be the heart of the analysis, which is whether the harassing conduct is serious enough that it unreasonably alters the jobs and its terms and conditions. The standard and guiding rules in our amendments are pulled from federal case law and Hi. guidance. Yeah. I'm happy to answer questions about those amendments. Thank you. Excellent, thank you very much. And next we'll have Ms. Siri. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Michelle Siri. I'm the Executive Director of the Women's Law Center of Maryland, not related to the national organization. And one of our many services that we operate is one of the only, if not the only, free statewide employment law hotlines in Maryland. I know my time is brief, so I'm gonna just start off by saying we are fully in favor of the intent behind this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for bringing it. Um, and we would very much look forward to working and an opportunity to work with Ms. Jordan, uh, Ms. Johnson, who we work with all the time. And of course, Mr. Goldsmith as well. I've had the pleasure of working with him. And so we'd look forward to that. You've already heard what the bill does and I don't need to belabor how onerous the severe pervasive standard is. Uh, but I do think that when it comes to statutory interpretation as a practitioner, I believe sometimes less is more. And so to that end, I do think, you know, there's language we've already heard a little bit of it um, that can clarify because I think uh, specifically having language about the un not falling under precedent could actually lead to incredible confusion and some seriously unintended consequences, including courts creating a new more stringent interpretation. Just because it doesn't fall under prior precedent doesn't mean they couldn't do something else. And so the, the easy suggestion that I would suggest uh, is that explicit statement that the harassment, um, the conduct need not be severe or pervasive, period. It's unequivocal, it's unambiguous. Um, and it doesn't leave room for misinterpretation. Similarly, there's uh, places where the language talks about a reasonable victim of discrimination, uses terms like petty slights, trivial inconvenience, minor annoyances. We think that um, those could also le lead to negative um, consequences and we would respectfully suggest language such as on the basis of the record as a whole or according to the totality of the circumstances because I think that's really the intent that that's behind that language. It's trying to get to the court must consider a multitude of factors. We cannot be looking at these in isolated in isolation just as Ms. Johnson was saying, especially when it comes to the intersection of race and gender. We can't be taking them apart and just looking at them um, separately. And so I think something like that language might be um, better for, better suited for the statute. And for all of those reasons, like I said, we would be happy to, um, to work on this. We 100% support the concept. Um, and also we support moving, quite frankly, the definition into Title 20. I think that's a smart move and, and makes a lot of sense as well. So thank you for the opportunity and, and happy to answer any questions. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, and the, the petty slice, I'd be interested to learn the history of that because that's in the statute now. And I thought that language is interesting, um, just having not, you know, I don't practice in this area in the Maryland, so it's interesting. Uh, always interested to hear the history behind that. Okay. Um, so with that, I think that concludes the testimony for the bill. We'll now turn it over to the committee for questions. Excellent. Seeing none, that concludes the testimony for Senate Bill. 834. Thank you all very much. I'll, um, I'll, be re I'll reach out to you all to circle up, see if we can do a, a Zoom meeting in the next week or so um, to hammer out some of the details before I bring it up for a vote. Thanks. All right. So committee members, we have, um, you noticed that we've had uh, some committee members work, absent working on the use of force They've established a separate Zoom room so they could do a work group and fi finish up the uh, work there. So let's, let's meet up here at um, Let's meet at 4.30 for a voting session. You'll have a streaming, 4.30 will uh, be down in the committee room for um, voting. Is that enough time for everyone, 4.30? Okay, great, I'll see you all soon. <laughs>